Hi all, our instructive game today will have the theme of line opening against the opponent's king. To demonstrate this theme, I'm going to take one of my own games played in the London Lloyds Bank Masters of 1993. My opponent was Krishnam Murphy uh, Murugan. He was around 2420 FIDE, so about 200 points higher than me on the FIDE rating system. I was playing white and played e4. I had some quick preparation with the help of my friend at the time, Mark Ferguson, who had, we'd, recent, we'd recently before that shared first in the Barnet Congress. And he had given me a, a little hint that Murugan sometimes plays his Shaveningen variation quite passively. So um, I was pleased when Murugan did play the Shaveningen, and I had a fierce attacking move prepared here. I played g4. So this is the Keres kind of attack. In fact, this might actually be the Keres attack. So named after Paul Keres, one of the great uncrowned kings in the history of the game. After knight c6, g5. So black has been forced back already, knight d7. And after h4, white's plan is, is pretty straightforward. White's going to try and castle queenside and blast black on the king side, trying to open up the lines, using these pawns as sort of battering rams for the black king. So after bishop e7, bishop e3, it's uh, the proper, like, the English system. It was popularised by a lot of um, English grandmasters like Nunn and others. So this is just a fierce, direct way of, of playing against the Shaveningen England Sicilian. And after castles, just queen d2, a6, and now I just castle queen side. So I've got a pleasant looking attacking position here. I've got possibilities of h5 and g6. But I suppose I have to factor in black's queen side counterplay. So black first took on d4, and after queen takes play, b5. So black's preparing things like bishop b7, also keeping the threats are open of b4 later, and d5. So black, if given enough time, will wipe white out on the queen side. So white has to play quite energetically here. I played first king b1, and after rook b8, black's preparing b4 in some variations. Now, this knight can be used aggressively, though. I switch it to the king's side. I play knight e2. So it's got the idea of knight g3 now, coming to the king's side, where it might have some threats of its own, like knight h5 now, eyeing that g7 pawn. Black played rook e8. But really, I want to open the lines. That's the main theme of this game. How do the lines get open? Well, first, I want to play h5 without dropping g5. So I drop my queen back to d2. Reinforcing g5, and after queen a5, I play now, finally, h5. So I'm getting a bit more confident in my position here. I'm going to play g6, opening up some lines against the black king. After knight c5, though, I'm a bit concerned now, because black might be threatening knight a4 and knight c3 check, and that would be quite lethal if black can open up the b line against my king. So, what is that motto in The Art of War? you first put yourself beyond defeat before going on to the attack. Well, here I did so subconsciously, without even knowing about the art of war. I played b3, so it stops knight a4. So if I can get in g6 more safely, why not, if there is time? But black plays very energetically now in the centre. He first plays bishop b7, and now after f3, he plays the aggressive d5. So is my centre falling to bits? Am I ever going to get this flank attack in, in time? He's using the principle that the best way to counter a flank attack is this reaction in the centre. And it seems a very well-timed d5 counter-strike. So again, I spend another move trying to reinforce my position. Ribka actually doesn't really like my move at all. It recommends something like bishop d g2. But I play bishop d3. So perhaps black has an advantage in theory and maybe he could have just snapped up that bishop immediately. Instead, he played rook d8. And now, I seize the opportunity to play g6. So opening up some lines, with at least some threats of maybe queen h2s. That's all I saw at this moment. But um, after take on d3, and I retook. Fg, hg, hg, I found a beautiful move here, which really transformed the position to, to a major advantage. Queen h2 might not be good enough, because the king can just come to f7. And if he can carry on attacking me with d takes e4, I'm going to be falling to bits if I'm not careful. Especially if he's got resources like bishop f6 as well, because this diagonal could be also quite dangerous. So, in this highly critical position, 
you don't really want to give black too much time so what would you play here I'll give you five seconds or if you want to stop the video this is the critical position of the game please stop the video and have a good think for say you know five ten minutes the move that I played was bishop d4 and the immediate threat now is rook h8 check because if king takes h8 then queen h6 check exploiting that pin which has now been created on the g7 pawn and then make next move so let's just demonstrate let's let's give black a null move here so uh, just an example move null move rook h8 and let's just give the continuation this so queen h6 and you can see that pin which has been created on the g pawn with make next move so that's a major threat black has to contend with so what does he do he plays a very very passive move he plays bishop f8 and now I just have a dream move, just queen g5, simple and attacking. And also it stops t takes e4 because of this pin on the d-pawn against black's queen on a5. So black now is in real trouble. He plays king f7. And I follow my original intention, which was rook h7. Because rook h7 creates the threat of queen f6, mate. However, in this position there's an even sharper move, Ribka reveals, which is rook h6. So that threatens queen takes g6, and if g takes h6, then queen f6 is mate. So that's an even sharper, more accurate move. Anyway, in the game I played rook h7, rook on the 7th rank. And he now played the desperate move e5, and I just took on e5, and I've got all sorts of threats now. I've got queen f4, followed by bishop c7, for example, forking queen and rook. After rook e6, queen f4 check. Thankfully, he resigned here, um, so that was I was really pleased. It was a, a big rating scalp at the time for me. Um, let's have a look. If he had played king e8, even stronger than bishop c7, is actually as, as Costas pointed out in in his video to me um, video, was bishop takes g7. So bishop takes g7 here is crushing as well because uh, you know what is black doing here? If if he takes rook takes g7 and there's an ominous threat now of queen f7 mate so if um, rook e7 rook takes g6 and now I've still got loads of threats like rook g8 and queen f5 so this is awful and in this position if um, say the bishop moves bishop e7 then there's an ultra sharp move here bishop f8 I hadn't seen any of this so I was just really intending um, in this position, just bishop c7, just forking queen and rook. So, um, anyway, the line opening had obviously succeeded there. And let's have a look in overview and summary at this game. So, a Sicilian, Shaven Ingham variation. So, black seemingly playing a little bit passively, letting me, you know, attack him on the king side and use this line opening mechanism. But, and timing is very important. If black had enough time, I would have been blasted, either on the queen side or in the centre. So there was just one opportunity given to me at one moment in time in this game, after this rook d8, to open up the lines, so the h line and the f line, and be able to play this absolutely beautiful attacking subtle move, bishop d4. So this is the, the key move of the game, as far as I'm concerned. It's the move I spent about half an hour trying to find at the time. So bishop f8, and it was all plain sailing after this. Just queen g5, and now rook h7, and white's pieces are all coming around black's king. So after e5, bishop takes, rook e6, queen f4 is, is crushing now. So he resigned. I hope you enjoyed that game. Please leave any comments on YouTube. Thanks very much.